In the late 60s, there was an artist working on something big, something that would spawn a revolutionary movement in the genre he was working on. His work would go down in history as some of the most memorable religious and political cult classics of all time. I, of course, am talking about legendary film director Alejandro Jodorowsky. Ha! I tricked you with a trick, because it kind of sounded like I was talking about Frank Herbert, but I wasn't. Jodorowsky released his first feature film, Fando Yilis, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in 1968, after a successful early career in surrealist theater. He went behind the backs of studios and producers to make his movie in Mexico, something that pretty much wasn't allowed in the Mexican film industry at the time, and released his nightmare post-apocalyptic silent film at the Acapulco Film Festival. This led to an actual full-scale riot that likes the festival and Mexico had never seen from a film, with its graphic and disturbing scenes of surreal violence and sex. But his name was cemented in the film industry with the success and controversy of the picture. So he set out on his next feature, this one not allowed to release in Mexico, and El Topo was born in 1970. This time, what seemed like a more traditional Western is, yet again, drenched in Judeo-Christian symbolism and rampant, disturbing content, including a rape scene from the main character, which Jodorowsky p- 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 plays the main he plays the main character, and apparently his scene partner uh, had trauma from actually being sexually assaulted. He later claimed that it was in the contracts that all sex scenes were simulated, but still, this is genuinely one of the most awful things he's done in his career. And yet again, the film, despite and in part because of its controversy, was wildly successful in the New York film sphere. And even if it wasn't universally loved by critics or audiences at the time, it was something that people really didn't have previously, and pretty much birthed the midnight showing, as it would only be shown in art house theaters very late at night, never even getting an official physical release until 2007, leading it to be something that you had to see if you had heard about its buzz and controversy at the time. And while this movie didn't make that much money, like Fando Ye List before it, it got a bunch of people interested in backing his next project, including John Lennon and George Harrison, leading Lennon and his partner Yoko Ono to pretty much personally fund whatever he wanted to do for his next dive into religious, surreal, sex, nightmare And so, in 1973, he made what is largely considered to be his masterpiece, The Holy Mountain. This film is hard to describe if you haven't heard of it or seen anything from it, as the majority of the plot follows a man learning from an alchemist who would turn his poop into gold. And he has to do a bunch of rituals, and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of dreams and visions as they ascend to this mountain that connects earth and heaven. It's it's a whole big thing. This film, I'm sure, was a nightmare to work on, as Yodorovsky and his wife would go days without sleeping, quote, under the direction of a Japanese Zen master, and the cast and crew would regularly be asked to take LSD and other psychedelic drugs, as well as other, quote, spiritual exercises, and they even all lived in Yodorovsky's communal home for a month before the production, which all sound like very concerning practices to me, but what do I know? The film was released at the 1973 Cannes Film Festival, where it was yet again met with his usual controversy and intrigue, and is largely now considered a masterpiece, the likes of which we never could or would get again. Also around the same time as all of this, the hit and revolutionary for the series Dune Messiah was taking reading audiences by storm, as well as its author Frank Herbert working on the next anticipated installment in the now science fiction giant, Dune. But but let's roll it back a little bit. Let's get more on topic and talk about Dune World. 
Dune World was a serial published from 1963 to 1964, and later, in 1965, there was a kind of sequel called The Prophet of Dune. Serials were one of the most popular ways for young authors at the time to release their works, all throughout the 19th and early 20th century. They would publish their writings in newspapers and magazines, and if they were successful, they could bring readers back monthly or even weekly to continue the story, much like weekly television would later be. This release style was used for, honestly, most books you probably read in a high school English class, and you can easily tell if you know what to look for. Things like Dracula, The Count of Monte Cristo, The Hounds of Baskervilles, and most Sherlock stories, and even something newer like Stephen King's The Green Mile. If you've ever read any of these, you may notice that the chapters are often denser and switch perspectives almost every chapter. This entire process was very cool for audiences and authors at the time, as young authors who hadn't really made anything else could get an audience hooked on their story and break into the industry, and audiences had consistently updating works, not unlike modern day fan fiction. And you can really tell this process if you keep this in mind for a lot of these books, as if you read chapter after chapter after chapter with no breaks in between, you'll notice that they're rather weirdly paced. And these serial runs of Dune took off rather well, and Frank Herbert decided to put this together into a three-book novel known as simply Dune. He would shop around and revise Dune over and over, getting refused by publishers again and again until he was finally picked up by Chilton Books? I, I, didn't, I didn't check the pronunciation of that one. Uh, it's, pro it's probably Chilton Books, a publishing company at the time most known for releasing auto repair manuals. Sterling Lanier, an editor at the time, took a major risk and talked the company into publishing Herbert's work, which upon initial release was mostly disliked and flopped, often thought to be due to its price, which would be in today's dollars about $50, an insane amount for a pretty much new sci-fi series when sci-fi wasn't really a well-known genre, despite Frank Herbert's pretty successful previous novels. This initial lack of sales actually led to Sterling getting fired from the company. Mainly through word of mouth, Dune would start to get a following, and then critics got to looking at it, and soon it started to explode. And really, it's not hard to see why. Dune is truly a masterpiece in my opinion. It's one of the most thematically rich and ahead of its time books that I can think of. Sure, it's just the Greek myth of the Atreides family combined with Lawrence of Arabia, but it wasn't just that. It was one of the first sci-fi novels to have a strong environmental message, along with a lot of ties to Islamic and Middle Eastern traditions and religion, framed in an actually mostly positive light, being very critical on the crumbling British Empire, and even with his sequels showing the Lawrence of Arabia side as Paul as he goes on to be a genocidal maniac who says that Hitler pulled weak numbers and exploits the Fremen culture and their religious beliefs to his benefit. But even with that, it's never one-sided. Paul is still a sympathetic main character. The story deconstructed gender roles at the time, heroism of the time, imperialism, racism, and religion, while never writing a completely one-sided narrative where there was a clear right and wrong. Its scale through the three-part novel, and especially as the series goes on, is honestly mind-blowing, and I personally think the series is one of the greatest achievements of literature. But as the beginning of the life of Dune showed, timing is everything. And Dune didn't have much of an audience at first. Even J.R.R. Tolkien, which I love the guy's work, but he was very much an author of his time who, who loved his, his empire and didn't think too fondly of certain groups of people, but he hated Dune. And he expressly said that he wouldn't even write a review on it because he hated it personally so much that he thought it would be unfair as an author to Herbert to write it. But it did find its footing and was even tied for a Hugo Award in 1966 and won the very first Nebula Award for Best Novel. And it's now considered one of the most influential modern sci-fi book series out there, selling millions of copies and being translated into dozens of languages all around the world. 
So naturally, everyone wanted to adapt it to the new bright and shiny art form of movies. Russell has called a big one. Again, it is the legend. And we'd have a big, up-and-coming, surrealist director step up to the plate to take hold of the tragic production that would almost ruin his career. And I, of course, am talking about David Lynch. See, I, I tricked you again, because that one, that time it kind of sounded like Jodorowsky, but previously it kind of sounded like, kind of sounded like Frank Herbert. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things you can, you could do that little fake out with. Anyway, in 1984, we would get the first ever adaptation of the hit series to the big silver screen. And it was interesting. Not sorry enough. Widely considered to be a commercial and critical failure, Dune is a barely held together 137 minute trip brought to you by some of the greatest young and old filmmakers in the industry and like the novel before it, it's gathered something of a cult following in recent years, with lots of people saying it's good, actually, and very book accurate. And we even recently got a 4K Arrow release with lots of special features and a poster, which I definitely don't have hanging on my wall as I'm editing this right now. I personally am fascinated by this movie, as a big fan of Dune and Lynch, and even underdog movies with a lot of practical effects. So I want to take this video, which has had a grotesquely long intro, to talk about what happened in this production that almost ended Lynch's career, and if the movie has any redeeming elements, any amount of good that would justify me spending $40 on the 4K, and a weird director whose cult-like practices would somehow have major influences on Lynch's work, and maybe every sci-fi movie to come after. Whoa! Just kidding, Yodorowsky sucks. I wasn't 100%. Um, I, I don't know quite how that happened. That's my one... Uh, in my mind, uh, big failure, and um, but I learned a tremendous amount on that film. I love Dino. I love his daughter Rafaela. I love the cast and crew, and I loved Mexico City. I was down there for a year and a half. Uh, Dune took three years to make, start to finish. Um, but it was a nightmare, and it was a nightmare. It's time to talk about Jodorowsky's Dune, which is the name of a documentary that came out in 2013 that kind of sucks and has no credited writer and is pretty much just Jodorowsky talking about how holy his production was and how his crazy intellect formed the ultimate dream team that studios just didn't have the vision to let happen, which there's a, a lot to dissect in that statement, but let's back it up a little bit and explain some things. So what I said earlier about Lynch's Dune being the first adaptation to the screen might have been a bit misleading. It's not wrong, but it, it's a little misleading, as it definitely wasn't the first production to try, or even the second, or even the third. In 1971, APJ or Appjack International? Question mark. Optioned the rights for a Dune adaptation to a major motion picture. The studio's first option for writer director on this film was David Lean. A very interesting choice because, as I said, Dune is pretty much Lawrence of Arabia in space, and I wonder what David Lean was up to a couple years earlier. Lean turned the film down, and it was offered to several other directors, and eventually they got someone to write a script, and even had a schedule to begin pre-production. But Arthur Jacobs, who was in charge of the project from APJ, died in 1973, and the film would never happen. That's when we come back to everyone's favorite director, Jodorowsky, who was fresh off the 1973 release of The Holy Mountain which a lot of people in the film industry really loved and pretty much offered, much like the Beatles with Holy Mountain, 
to fund him making whatever he wanted. This time with an even more insane lack of limitations, as according to the documentary, they pretty much told him, pick your favorite thing and we will let you adapt it, no matter what it is. You could pick anything. And for some reason, he decided to pick Dune, despite having not even read it. He actually claims in that documentary that he doesn't even know why he wanted to make Dune, but gosh darn it, he was going to try. And in 1973, Jean-Paul Gibson purchased the film rights for Jodorowsky. Now, I could go into the pre-production of this more than I'm going to, but I've already spent way more time talking about Jodorowsky than I want to, so let's just say his ambition and practices far exceeded his means, because he wasn't going to make this in the traditional way. No, no. His production was too blessed from above for that. He was going to hire some of the best comic artists at the time to completely create his vision in a storyboard book. Then he was going to travel all around the world, trying to track down random people he thought would be good for the film, and get them to agree to be in it before he ever even talked to a studio. He got Mick Jagger to agree to play Fade Reutha. He got Pink Floyd to agree to do the music. He had Dan O'Bannon and H.R. Geiger on the special effects. He even was so set for some reason on getting Salvador Dali to play the Emperor that he agreed to make him the most paid actor of all time at the time, offering him $100,000 an hour, as well as agreeing to put his girlfriend, who apparently was not very good at acting, in his film. And again, this was all before anyone other than Jodorowsky had approved or questioned anything, even getting several of them to sell pretty much everything they had and move to Paris to work on the film with him. You can watch the documentary for yourself to find out in more detail in a very biased way, but the moral of the story is, after spending almost every penny they had on just the pre-studio pre-production, they started going to different studios with their insanely long storyboards and paintings and fully casted movie that would cost a fortune and probably make zero dollars because it was going to be nearly ten hours, if not longer, and <gasps> no studio wanted to touch it. At least, not as it was. Disney actually was considering it if they cut it down to a traditional two-hour movie. Which, of course, Jodorowsky, in his genius, in his never-ending intellect, didn't want to cut a single thing. So eventually, they just ran out of money. He even, according to the documentary, had his own son who also appeared in El Topo, cast as Paul, and again, before any studio actually said they would fund this thing and produce this thing, he put him through extreme educational and physical and combat training, saying that he would sacrifice his son's happiness to make the film, that he would even be willing to die for the film. Needless to say, the film would never happen, and would really never see the light of day, but everyone in the documentary assures you that it would have been a masterpiece. Like, no, literally, the tagline of the film is, the greatest science fiction movie never made. They actually, at the end of the documentary, despite the film never getting made, and most of the studios laughing it off for being a stupid idea, claim that this film was pretty much directly responsible for every single sci-fi movie after it, inventing almost every new film technique despite never being filmed, and even showing side-by-sides of concept art to like random shots in Prometheus where a mountain looks vaguely like a building design, as if it was this big revelation about its influence. It's literally the same kind of thing as everyone who was making the he was the template tweets about how shots in other movies kind of vaguely looked similar to shots from Zack Snyder movies. But I digress. Dune's movie days weren't over yet, and in 1976, Dino De Laurentiis, extremely prolific film producer, including working on films like Flash Gordon, Halloween 2, Blue Velvet, and even Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness, purchased the rights to make a Dune movie. He got Herbert himself to write a screenplay that was nearly three hours long, which he then handed off to director Ridley Scott. Which, random side note, would work with the same O'Bannon and Geiger to make Alien in 1979. You 
probably know both of those names because of their work on Alien, which is truly the best thing to come out of Jodorowsky's production. Scott and Rudy Wurlitzer would work on another draft from Herbert's script, and even decided the genius move, like literally the genius move, to break the story into two movies. I wonder if some other later adaptation would use this idea. But ultimately, Scott would drop out, realizing how much of his life would be taken up by a project he wasn't super passionate about, and also allegedly because his older brother Frank died of cancer while they were working on it, which freaked him out. So Scott stepped away and made Blade Runner instead. Again, probably for the best. But Dune was yet again in production limbo as the film sat unmade for nine years, the rights just waiting to go to somebody else. And in 1981, the year De Laurentiis' rights were expiring, he renegotiated the contract, including getting the rights to do a sequel, because he apparently believed the production could be something special. I mean, everyone did. That's why so many greats were willing to work on it in the first place. De Laurentiis' daughter, Raffaella, around this time went out to the theater and watched The Elephant Man, the first studio film from up-and-coming director David Lynch. And she thought he would be a perfect fit for Dune. Lynch, after the pretty respectable success of The Elephant Man, was being offered several films, including... Return of the Jedi? That would have been weird. That, that would have been really weird. But out of all of his offers, he agreed to work on Dune, despite not being really very familiar with the story. I know I never heard of it. I thought he said June. And in retrospect, I feel kind of bad for him. Because if you can't tell by this point, Dune was kind of a hard story to adapt. In fact, to this point, I would almost call it a cursed production. But everyone still believed in it. In March of 1983, with several Lynch drafts down and a script over 130 pages long, they were finally ready to begin production. And I don't want to put this lightly, but this was already a very long year of pre-production, with extensive work on art direction and adaptation and even influences from Scott's and Jodorowsky's scripts and art and other ideas such as the rock band to do the score as they got Toto to do their version and Sting to play Fade. So, Mr. Sting, thank you for being here. And they realized how big in scale this production was going to be, and despite it being a European production, they decided to shoot it in Mexico due to the exchange rate and the fact that they needed a lot of space. They had some of the best modern minds in set design and construction and effects and makeup and costuming and even animatronics and model artists working on the film. They built over 80 sets on 16 sound stages with an ever-inflating budget and a massive cast and crew, and the filming itself would take most of the year as they continued to have more and more technical problems with their lofty sets and failing electricity and communication due to the infrastructure of Mexico at the time. They even had several health issues with the actors, as working in rubber suits in the Mexican desert is maybe not a great idea, on top of the fact that for several of the special effects, they did things that were just straight up dangerous, like burning rubber tires to get black smoke for several of the fights that the extras and stuntmen had to just try their best to avoid breathing, even though that was nearly impossible with the ever-shifting wind. Even Kyle MacLachlan, this being his first ever movie role, in an interview said it blew onto him and Patrick Stewart during one of the scenes, and for several minutes, he couldn't even talk at all because of the smoke. And despite Lynch seeming very invested in the beginning of the production, as time went on and issues kept piling up in the heat, with a nervous studio continuing to doubt this massive production, it soon became a nightmare for Lynch, and clearly something he regrets later describing it as a great sadness, a very Lynch way of describing that it was miserable to work on. And things didn't get better for him, or any of the rest of the crew, as they moved into post-production. The rough cut of the film, without a lot of the effects or scenes even finished filming yet, ran over four hours, and this got the producers from Universal very uneasy, as the traditional movie length at the time, and even now, was about two hours, and they wanted their two hours. 
so after most of the filming had wrapped, they had to go back and rewrite several chunks of the movie, replacing whole portions of the film with one or two scenes. In an interview on the disc for the 4K release, they even claimed to have filmed one scene to replace eight or nine scenes in the second act, a massive blow to any narrative or emotion the film had going for it. Lynch, at this point, was fighting for anything he could, but eventually, essentially, gave up as the studio had final say. Due to the cut down on the story, they decided to add in voiceover and a new intro for the movie, and most of the dialogue scenes were cut down to whatever was strictly necessary to kind of explain what was going on. Oh yes, I forgot to tell you, the spice exists on only one planet in the entire universe, a desolate, dry planet with vast deserts. Hidden away within the rocks of these deserts are a people known as the Fremen, who have long held a prophecy that a man would come, a messiah, who would lead them to true freedom. The planet is Arrakis, also known as Dune leading it to be mostly uninterrupted exposition, with voiceover explaining the things that we could already see on the actors' faces. What's wrong with Gurney? He's not making this. But this wasn't even enough. The film still tested poorly with audiences, and if they hadn't read the book, many of them didn't understand things, so Universal decided to release the film with a freaking pamphlet. An actual pamphlet explaining the terminology of the film. It's multiple pages long, and included in the book that comes with the 4K disc. I've read it, it's insane, and it feels kind of offensive to its audiences, as they apparently thought what was wrong with the movie was that audiences didn't know what a thumper was, and that it thumps. Not that they cut down on anything that made the second half even slightly cohesive if you weren't already really familiar with the book. And along with all of this, the studio had zero idea how to market it. Despite the production team and Lynch himself understanding that Dune is really more of an adult story, Star Wars had just released, and broken like all of the studio's minds. Yo, especially with its marketing and tie-in toy lines. So you know what we got? The worst toy line idea ever. Dune toys. And yes, there are Dune toys for the new one too, but those are really more in the collectible sphere for adults. That largely wasn't a mainstream thing in the 80s. You didn't make toy lines for adult movies, you made them for kids. This was a new practice in general in the film industry that pretty much started in the 70s with Jaws. I actually did a whole video on how that started a lot of trends that would lead to Star Wars. You should check it out. My kids are wild about E.T. Now there's a whole collection of E.T. toys. So what was the message being sent out about this film to audiences? It's another Star Wars, a nice camp family fun adventure, which is bad for Dune. In fact, this led the studio to also cut down on any nudity this film was going to have, and the sex scenes that are kind of still in the movie. And I imagine, though this is 100% pure speculation, some of the gore as well, as they really wanted this film to hit an 80s PG-13, at the very least. And of course, with this hodgepodge of not understanding the material, and even the fact that adapting this story to a movie is insane, let alone cutting it down a lot, led it to be a movie that wasn't really for anyone, and that no one really liked. Most audiences didn't understand the story, and if they did, they didn't understand it on an emotional level, because there's genuinely nothing to understand there. Critics didn't like it, mass audiences didn't like it. The toy line was cancelled before it even finished making all of the products it was advertising. The production lost money, and Lynch was so disappointed with the film that he's pretty much publicly disowned it ever since, and said that he never wanted to make another big studio film again, and is also lacking in pretty much all of the promotional or extra materials that released after the film did. It was actually kind of eerie watching the special features and hearing all of them talk about Lynch, but he just never shows up at all. You can tell this production really left a sour taste in his mouth. 
But again, this was a long time ago, and people have sat with this film a lot and watched Dune get more and more adaptations, and even a very acclaimed one recently. And people have watched Lynch's career go on to be super acclaimed and loved, often due to the lack of studio control and the team he had collaborated with for most of his career, even Dune. Has this given people the opportunity and means to go back and recontextualize the things they so brashly hated about the initial release? No, not really, and most people who watch it now either watch it out of curiosity because they love Dune, or out of curiosity because they love Lynch. For me, it's both, and even then, it's easily Lynch's most universally hated, or at least his most meh film. But honestly, I, I kind of like it. So let's finally talk about it. There are some books that should never be made into movies. Moby Dick is one of them. It's been made several times now, and it's never made well. Moby Dick is one of those things that is a book. Leave it as a book. As we say in Yiddish, wasn't game, let be. Don't mess with it. There are some things you just don't screw with. Well, I always thought that about Dune. I thought Dune was one of those books that read well, and in the theater of your mind, your imagination could make it far more ebullient, more opulent, sexier, more adventurous, more dark and many layered than you ever could in a film. I like Dune. I really do. Lynch's Dune takes the story in a unique and honestly really fun direction. It's very much of the time that it came out, and you can see that in a lot of the beautiful costumes and insane sets and goofy creatures and makeup. I, I, I love the Guild Navigator. I can't, I can't not talk about the Guild Navigator. Look at him. He is so cool in every scene he's in. Don't call his special effects bad. They are beautiful. He is, he is flying. His little, his little his, his spice mouth is just controlling, it's controlling the space, and he is beautiful. And honestly, as adaptations go, it's pretty darn book accurate in a lot of ways, especially in the spirit that the film captures. Not that that ensures its quality in any way. In fact, movie adaptations that try to be very accurate from the source material often end up having lots of problems because that's not how good adaptations work. You want to make what works best for your medium, not just copy-pasting every element to the new medium. Again, what if they did this with Dracula, like, that constantly switched perspectives every five minutes, told in this really weird historical way? It just wouldn't be the same as the Dracula that everyone knows and loves, because that's not how adapting, especially literature, works. But honestly, it's pretty impressive that this movie pulls off what it tries to, even as well as this. It just needed a lot more time to do the things it actually wanted to do. I love the cast, and I love a lot of the practical effects. Heck, I'm even a shield defender for this movie. I think the effect works in a really fun and goofy way. I, I really enjoy this. And in the end, despite Lynch's distance and sadness towards the film, you can really feel his authorship all over this. The Harkonnens especially feel like something straight out of his mind. They're over the top and goofy, and yet pull a really good amount of disturbing unease with a lot of the characterization around them. I really love the heart plug scene and just the imagery that it has. It's really powerful and memorable. The imagery of this entire movie is really what makes it stand out beyond its very apparent flaws. I may not remember the dialogue of some of these moments or the random special effects that didn't age very well, but what I do remember is the blood splattering against the green wall and the purple flowers. I may think the second act of the movie is borderline unwatchable, but I do vividly remember the imagery of all the sandworms surrounding Paul as he takes the water of life. It's a powerful scene, even if it was the alleged scene put in to replace eight or nine scenes. And the visuals and the music especially elevate it to something more. Toto did the score, and it's great. I've been humming it for the past month, and it really adds a lot to the solid visuals and production design and massive sets and lavish costumes to have this powerful music that really makes you feel like something important is happening, something you need to look at. Even during my least favorite part of this film, there's almost always something visually interesting happening. Whether it's the imagery, or the cinematography, or me wondering how they pulled off the special effects. I can't understate this enough, but the spice-induced dreams, when they're actually allowed to happen, are really freaking awesome. 
that's one of the things I was most excited about personally, to see a Lynch adaptation of Dune. Yes. Terrifying to us. To women. This is the place they cannot look. From the films I've seen from Lynch, he very much understands surrealism and the dreamlike nature a film can take on. I mean, Lost Highway is pretty much just a crazy dream Lynch had after spending too long at a jazz bar the night before, or at least it feels that way. I knew a book fascinated with the opening of Paul's mind and his expansion of consciousness as he sees all that could be. Getting an adaptation from Lynch would be amazing. And yeah, honestly it is. If only it really meant anything, but it is a fundamentally flawed film, much in the way Monster Hunter 2020 is, but in a much less extreme. Oh yeah, I'm finally getting an excuse to talk about Monster Hunter 2020. <sighs> Monster Hunter at the end of the day is a film that feels cut up to the point that you can't understand a single thing that is happening, and I mean that in the most story and emotional cohesion way possible. Your brain can look at what happens in the movie and understand it, and even explain it to someone. But ask anyone who's seen it whether they study film or not, and I guarantee you they will say something feels off about it. Most people can't even put it into words, but the plot just kind of happens. Scene after scene goes by as they barely feel like they're from the same movie despite being the same actors on the same set playing the same characters. And in this instance, it's because the film has been cut down so much. And not just cut down because there was unnecessary footage or to make the pacing work any better, but to cut something out and to save time and money. And they cut and they cut and they cut just to the point of actually cutting major plot points. And what you're left with is this inhuman shell that your brain can barely even recognize as a story. The story is just jumping from thing to thing, and that's exactly how the second half of Dune feels. The first half of Dune, essentially what was adapted to part one in the newer adaptation, is honestly pretty good in my opinion. It's when the film is at its best. I'm invested in the story, it looks good, the scenes are very similar to the book, and the performances are an intriguing combination of goofy and serious. Sure, you still have the voiceover and the really, really overt exposition, which is bad and laughable throughout, but I can easily personally look past that. I mean, I watch anime, so I'm used to ignoring annoying, unnecessary voiceover and explanations that treat their audiences like they're stupid. There's honestly just a lot of creativity in the first half's adaptation, in a way we don't often see anymore, where the creators so effortlessly combine the text of their source material with their own style, and it creates this world that I just want to dig into more, which is what the first half of Dune in the book does. It presents you with a lot of stuff without much explanation, and the rest of the story you get to see all the secrets and mysteries start to unfold, as well as leaving a lot of broad and interesting questions about the world and the morals of what the characters are doing. And the first half feels like it does a pretty good job at this. There are some exceptions, like Duncan just appearing twice and dying with like two sentences of dialogue, and just a general one for this stupid, in my opinion, decision to make the weirding way guns, but I guess that was easier for the movie to create shorthand and a reason for why the Emperor would go to such great lengths to take out House Atreides, so... Even I understand that. I like the still suits in this almost more than the new designs. I like how tangible everything feels despite its grand appearance, like the training bot. You can tell they actually made that training bot and it had to move around to get these shots. Or even for the Baron, the fact that this fat suit was actually too heavy for the actor to stand up in, so he was always being suspended on set even when he wasn't filming. It makes his floating feel very natural and 
a real part of his character. I like the amount of work that they went into on the designs from the different planets, and how all that work blends depending on the location you're on, and how goofily evil the Harkonnens are, but not being able to rely on the darkness of CGI, so they have these bright sets with powerful imageries and goofy performances, even if they're never really given the chance to go anywhere. I love this movie's worm design. In fact, I love having practical worms so much, it makes me wish we had that so bad in the new one, despite the new one being a lot better. And the lack of reliance on CG for most of the movie leads it to being so much better lit than the new one. You feel like you can see everything, and any time it gets dark it feels like an intentional contrast instead of something to hide CGI or to achieve that lovely modern Apple TV Plus trademarked natural lighting that everything uses now. Though Villeneuve and his team have always been good at using that style in the most effective way I've ever seen it done. I even like the more strange feel a lot of the performances have in this movie. It gives the film to me a sense of theater that allows me to suspend my disbelief even more and just enjoy this tragedy play out. If you just showed me the first half of this movie, I would love it and be like, wow, that's almost a great Dune Part 1. It's exciting, and I love its style for the story and its detail, and the sets are great. But I sure am interested to see what they're going to do with the far denser half of the plot, where most of the important character things happen, but not much actual plot, as well as a major time jump. And so we get to Dune Part 2, as I will call it. And well, it honestly feels like watching like a Dune highlight reel or recap, much like Monster Hunter, though again, Monster Hunter has even less distinguishable plot than this, because this actually has a decent first half. It runs straight into all of the same problems of getting cut down, and in this situation, they cut straight into the heart of Dune. Ask anyone, and they'll probably tell you everything really important to Paul as a character and the plot of the first book really happens after Paul gets in with the Fremen. The story is defined by its harsh look into the blind following of religious messiahs and the direct danger of combining politics and religion, the two driving forces of the series. And you get all of that in a very interesting way in the book. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Dune was serialized. And not only was it serialized, it also had two different serial runs. So, what the second half of this story does, what is Book 2, Muad'Dib, and Book 3, The Prophet, in the actual novel, is take its time as Paul's character drastically changes and builds a strong relationship and following as he learns the ways of the Fremen, and Jessica and Alia have their whole thing going on. And it's a lot of text and just stuff if you're reading it all at once, and it can honestly come off as kind of boring. Not much is actually happening as you get monologues and brief action scenes as Paul uses his influences to slowly take over the planet from underneath the Harkonnens and the Emperor. There's a lot of the core of Paul's character revealed and explored through this, as he is no longer having prophecy forced onto him, it's now up to him to decide where he takes the prophecy. He explores the spiritual depths of his power, and he grapples with the feeling of terrible purpose that foreshadows the dark path he takes. It's really my favorite part of the book, and the reason why I almost like Dune Messiah more than Dune, because so much of that book is similar to the second half of Dune, getting deeper into the sociological and political relationships and this thing that is guiding Paul and the way he chooses to engage with it. But that's just hard to translate to a movie. Very hard. It's one of the reasons that I did a previous video on this channel talking about how worried I was to get an adaptation of this story. It's not something that lends itself to a direct, literal adaptation. You need to adapt and cut down to the feeling and the emotion of what the story is and peel back everything that doesn't work. But that's not what happened with Dune. We got just the opposite. Instead, all of those pesky dreams and conversations and sociological questions have to get convolutedly blown out of the side of the building into the mouth of a sandworm that conveniently was going by just then. We are left with the appearance of the plot of Dune. Paul gets in with the Fremen, learns their ways, they follow him thinking he's their messiah, and he teaches them his ultra-dangerous fighting method, and he ultimately becomes what they all think is the Kwisat Tadarak, and leads them to a coup against the Emperor and the defeat of House Harkonnen. Like, yeah, that that's what happens. Heck, we even have all the side characters here. I'm sure Chani is here for some reason. 
right? Remember those gender norm breaking things that I was talking about? Yeah, I thought not, because every female character in this is barely on screen. Lady Jessica? Sure, she does become a reverend mother. Alia? She sure is here. Even in the first half, the movie suffers from this breakneck speed that it has to have after cutting down any emotion. With the death of Duke Leto and his poisoned tooth that lasts just like five seconds and barely gives you any time to breathe... <laughs> get it because this movie just doesn't have any time and because of that you can't tell the story of dune it it, it just is nothing but good looking sets and weird special effects for half the movie any given scene they will set something up and speech only of course and then the next scene will just be that thing happening jessica our reverend mother is too old she has been calling through space and time for you to come and let her rest. She asks that you pass within and become our reverend mother. If you be a reverend mother... Because they didn't have time for anything else. But I still really want to love it. The climax of the film and the palace once they've essentially already won, and the fight with Sting is just so good. There are genuinely great moments in this film that shine through as complete Dune magic for me, where I'm fully immersed, but the next thing I know, it's just over, and I felt nothing for the movie. We never see Paul grow as a character, and we never see why anyone follows him. We're told that they do. We don't know why it's all of a sudden raining, or why all the sandworms are here if that's the conclusion. Like what happened to the environmental message too, that's gone. They're just here. It makes for a narrative mess of a film that unfortunately deserves a lot of its bad rep. If I didn't love Dune so much, and had maybe read it once like a, several years ago and then kind of forgot about it, I would honestly have no idea what was going on in this film, and no amount of text explanations of what a Sappho is, or a maker hook, or all the nonsense that they gave to people as explanations that they actually thought would help, can fix it. Because it wasn't that audiences were stupid, it was that you actively cut the story of Dune out of your very book-accurate adaptation of Dune, and all the talent and effort and years of people trying to make it work just didn't. So maybe it is the cursed production. Maybe we'll never really get to see what Dune could be. Oh, oh wait! If Dune had been the financial success that people were predicting uh, early on, uh, would your career trajectory been any different? Would you have still made those same films that you're now known for, or would you have gone off into another direction? I have no idea, and as I've always, <laughs> I always say, Dune is a huge, gigantic sadness in my life, because I did not have final cut on that film, total creative control I didn't have, so uh, the film is not the film that I would have made had I had that final control, so it's a bit of a sadness, and... Uh, but I'm still happy that you like it. And... <laughs> I like thank many, many parts of Dune myself. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, in 2021, a very cool and very good adaptation of Dune came out. It's not perfect by any means, but the one thing that it really captures well is understanding the spirit of Dune, not just the plot points. So why even talk about this movie? Why examine how it came to be and what works and doesn't work with it? Well, honestly, it's because I think this production is really important and kind of beautiful. It's an epic movie, the likes of which we'll probably never see again. The scale and the art forms that were used in it, and even the era of actors, are just gone. And I think their work, and the legacy this movie had behind it, are worth remembering. 
I still really like Lynch's Dune. I have a poster for it literally hanging on my wall, right next to signed prints from the artist who did the Dune graphic novel. I actually got to see a panel with them and Kevin J. Anderson, the co-author of the new Dune books that came out after Frank Herbert's death. It was really cool, and yet again, it was a whole other group of artists inspired by this amazing, influential, and powerful story. But I can't deny that the movie we got is just mediocre. A fraction of the sum of its parts. It becomes, for me... A deep sadness. So maybe I do understand Lynch. It was a failure on epic proportions, literally, that almost ended the career of one of my favorite artists, and yet there's something really unique and fascinating inside of it. Art is never perfect, and we may not get very many of these creative and artistically fueled runs at something as big as Dune or Star Wars or Alien ever again, even if it didn't turn out perfect. I mean, look at the creators who are attached to this thing. Yudorowsky of The Holy Mountain, Ridley Scott just off the back of his Against All Odds masterpiece Alien, and David Lynch who had only directed Eraserhead, a surrealist horror nightmare, and The Elephant Man. And as much as I loved the Villeneuve and a lot of his movies, the studio didn't pick him because he was a good artist. I mean, I'm sure that was part of the reason, but they picked him because he had a lot of success to his name. He made Blade Runner 2049, a movie that would bring in half of your audience to this movie already. And I know that's kind of a cynical look at why he was hired onto this movie. I think he was genuinely a smart decision. We're just living in an era where new works of art and artists are kind of a luxury. There's a Writers Guild strike going on right now because studios are realizing that they can pay artists less and less to get computers to do the same thing, but more lifeless. Literally sucking all humanity and artistry out of one of the most creative art forms in existence. We live in a landscape where young up-and-coming filmmakers have to hope that studios will hire them on to the latest sequel or remake and that they turn it into something profitable enough where they just might be able to make the project that they want. I don't like hating on Yodorovsky so much, because despite me not liking him, or the kind of movies he makes, or his practices, what he did, and what he pulled off with his pretty much solo-funded, almost no-budget films, is insanely impressive and good for the film industry. He was just stupid and didn't know his own limitations. So, in a world where creativity and artistry are very rarely let out to breathe in the film studios, I think it's important to remember the times when things were even slightly better. Even if they didn't hit it out of the park. Even if the studios are still the ones responsible for taking it down to what it is now. It's still a work of art with a massive amount of insanely skilled people, and tons of time and money and full years poured into it, and I would love to see that happen again, and I think it's important to recognize where these productions went wrong, as although it wasn't entirely the studio's fault, so much of what didn't work about this can be traced to the same thing that plagues movies so much now. Studios not trusting artists or audiences and wanting to sell to them as much as possible, to make it as much of a product as possible taking all of that craft and time and ability and effort and not trusting it to see the light of day. Lynch only recently has given any comment on Dune, with the remaster and criterion of Inland Empire, and an interviewer asked him yet again about Dune, this time with a slightly different response than normal. Lynch replied, But Dune people have said, Don't you want to go back and fiddle with Dune? And I was so depressed and sickened by it, you know? I want to say, I loved everybody that I worked with. They were so fantastic. I loved all the actors. I loved the crew. I loved working in Mexico. I loved everything, except that I didn't have Final Cut. I even loved Dino, who wouldn't give me what I wanted. And Rafaela, the producer, who was his daughter. I loved her. But the thing was a horrible sadness and failure to me. And if I could go back in, I've thought, well... Maybe I would on that one, go back in. Yeah, I wanted to walk away. I always say, and it's true, that with Dune, I sold out before I finished. It's not like there's a bunch of gold in the vaults waiting to be cut and put back together. 
It's like early on, I knew what Dino wanted and what I could get away with and what I couldn't. And so I started selling out. And it's a sad, sad, pathetic, ridiculous story. But I would like to see what is there. I can't remember. That's the weird thing. I can't remember, and so it might be interesting. There could be something there, but I don't think it's a silk purse. Frank Herbert paid a visit to the sets for the first time to see how his dream was growing. The difficulty is actually building the sets, creating the reality that before you could build cheaply in your head. Oh my God, the Great Hall is tremendous. It really is. Everything I've seen, I see is doomed. That was no accident. David Lynch and Herbert saw Dune with essentially the same eye. Lynch's screenplay relied heavily on Frank's book, and as a result, a special relationship developed between them. He's been more of a friend and a supporter uh, than anything else, which is the most important thing that he could be. It's going to be a real story about real people. That's what David Lynch is doing. Okay, Frank. <laughs> Finally, on March 30th, 1983, after two years of pre-production, the day arrived that Herbert had dreamed of. The day Dune would come to life. Dune. Slate one, take one. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I was really excited to put this one together. I hope I wasn't too brief for all of you Dune fans out there who really wanted me to get into the intricacies of the fight with Sting or more stuff about the production or whatever. I felt like I already spent too much time on the production, but I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you guys go out there and support more indie projects. I know it's kind of a weird statement to take out of a movie that is very definitely not an indie project, but trust me guys, it makes sense. And if it doesn't, then just go back to the beginning of the video and, and watch it again, because, you know, it might just make more sense. In fact, the secrets of the video will only be revealed to you if you click the like button and comment, uh, reveal the secrets. If you do that, you will understand my thoughts, my genius, my world-changing sci-fi influential genius paper that I just wrote. You'll understand that all. Uh, I promise. <laughs> so uh, shout out to my Patreon supporter, Robbie Grayway. He also supplies a lot of the equipment for this channel, so definitely a big shout out to him. I also consult him on stuff. I also stole a joke from him. So so just a big shout out to Robbie Grayway in general. Go Go check out his stuff. And I will see you guys hopefully next month. I don't know. I kind of have a crazy next couple of months coming up. So we'll see when the next video comes out. Uh, but I love you all, and I'll see you in the next one. So, Mr. Sting, thank you for being here. Your name intrigues me, I have to say. Where have I heard it before? I, I was with a band called The Police. But you've never been a police officer of any kind, have you? Uh, no, I haven't. No, you haven't. And so here we have yet another example of bee culture being casually stolen by a human for nothing more than a prance-about stage name. Oh, please. Have you ever been stung, Mr. Sting? Because I'm feeling a little stung, Sting. Or should I say, Mr. Gordon M. Sumner? Oh! Not his real name, you idiot! Hey.